again. You have just watched and heard a wonderful version of You Will Never Walk Alone, sung virtually by 300 voices from 15 countries. The spirit and voices of this song are amazingly comforting. As we continue in much confinement with the COVID-19 issues, and in our awareness of the tumultuous storms of our world, we may deeply hear the message of these lyrics. We will be talking further today and in weeks to come about why we are not alone. Today, Richard is reminding us of the life that is being prepared for us in heaven itself. Even as we live out our days here, on the brink of that glorious eternity. Mary is reintroducing us to Charles Wesley during the 1700s, a founder of the Methodist denomination. He wrote over 7,000 hymns. It was said that he penned on the average of 10 lines of poetry a day for 53 years writing these hymns. The lyrics of his hymns are lessons and sermons in themselves about the subject of our great God, His work, and His purposes. As we sing several of them today, the clearest videos are with choirs, particularly the Grace Community Choir. A trio of young singers with instruments produced Rejoice the Lord is King by Wesley. Their, pur their purpose was to help the church sing when they could not meet together. As I continue to read and think from several sources, I am drawn to know more for myself 
about the nature and the work and the purposes of God, thinking much about the turbulence that we daily experience. I have quoted from Jonathan Kahn and found from him again great insight. He was discussing one of the names of God, which is Elohim. The name, of course, is a noun, and in the Greek, the last syllable, him, is plural. Well, it seems that this word for God would be plural, making it God's. However, God is a singular reality. So what can this mean? He goes on to say that the, that the plural, in this case, means more. Extension. Even endless. So whatever we think God is, He is more. We think He is good, and He is better. Even the best. We think him majestic, but he is more majestic. Him beautiful, but he's more than beautiful. We think him amazing, but he's much more than amazing. Elohim means that no matter how much we think we know of him, there's always so very much more to know. Therefore, we are to seek. There is no end. Last week, we spoke of our friend, actually in Oklahoma, who early in his day reads from J.I. Packer's Knowing God. He then mulls over what he reads as he and his wife go about their activities for the day. I found out that this British writer, J.I. Packer, is an Oxford scholar, a theologian, teacher and speaker, but that he died at age 93 in Canada. He wrote this book not really thinking there would be much interest in it. It was published in 1973 originally, and from that time until 1993, over one million copies were sold in 12 languages. Today, in 2021, I'm looking to buy a copy in big print, but I'm having to, do, to make do with my husband's tattered copy. Just what is it about this book? Elizabeth Elliot said it is like the shepherd putting the hay near so the sheep can reach it. It's like this theologian shows us ordinary folks what it means to know God. It is a book of nurture. While honest questions are asked, such as how does evil exist with God's sovereignty and goodness? How is evil mastered so that good can come from it? And in relation to sin, how are racial sinfulness and personal perversity credible? etc., etc. Complex questions, to say the least. Packer writes that the highest science, the mightiest philosophy which can engage our attention, is the name and the nature, the person and the work, the doings and existence of the great God that we call Father. Theology, or the knowledge of God, boring? Only if what we learn is not practiced, therefore it's seen as irrelevant. A few, a few friends and I gather on Friday nights for wonderful selections of entertaining as well as thought-provoking movies. A week ago, we watched an older film entitled The Good Lie, which was the background and story of four members of a Kenyan family surviving war and arriving in America as refugees. One was starting at ground level to become a doctor, already having had experience in Africa as he followed the village medical personnel around. Their mother, who did not survive the vicious attacks by guerrilla warfare, had taught them to read, and as Christians they read their one copy of the Bible. The film is the story of their experience within the new American culture. They survived it also. 
with great integrity but further challenge and sacrifice. Packer writes that without the knowledge of God, we ourselves are types of refugees within the kingdom of God. We blindfold ourselves so that we stumble and blunder through life with little or no sense of direction or understanding of what surrounds us. It is indeed possible to waste our lives and lose our souls as well. The particularly good news, though, is that wherever we are, we can start over, even in the middle of storms. The purpose of studying God is to know Him, to enlarge our acquaintance. As we use the right end of the telescope for this study, we will know God is the subject of the study. Our, he also would be our helper for the study and the purposeful end after the study. We are taught by Packer that as we learn, we think and we meditate, we pray and we praise. And this results in calling these things to mind, thinking over them, dwelling on them, applying ourselves to the works and the ways and the purposes and, and the promises of the God who we, whom we come to know in the process of the study. As our knowledge and our attempt to apply it increases, there is also an increase of peace and strength and joy for our lives. If you want, pick up a copy of this book and read along with us. You will find it at a half price bookstore or at a Christian bookstore or even through Amazon books ordering by mail. We will be pulling thoughts from this and talking further of these things in coming weeks. For now, have a great week. And again, with thoughts from the Valley of Vision, let's pray. Our God and Heavenly Father, at this stage of our lives, we are learning in part 
that there is no comfort in anything apart from enjoying you. You truly are all in all, and any pleasure that we have is what you provide us. We are in danger of doing what is unwise, and you are infinitely wise. We thankfully leave all things at your disposal. Our prayers turn to adoration because of your goodness. What should we do for you? We may even want to make some return to you, but realize that we have nothing to offer. We can do little, but through grace cheerfully, we can surrender our souls and our bodies. Lord, we know that you are the author and finisher of faith, that the whole work of redemption is yours alone, that every good work or thought found in us is the effect of your power and grace working in us to do your good pleasure. We thank you this day for teaching us these things, for drawing us to yourself so that we might commit to these things. May we continue learning of you so that daily we may refer to you for all things. We pray through grace alone, by faith alone in Christ alone. Amen.
Well, I'm thankful to be here today, and I'm thankful that you're with us as well. I had a few more thoughts that um, I wanted to close out the new year with as we draw near to the end of January. And um, thinking about New Year's celebrations, uh, even though they're not in the Bible, or the celebrating the New Year in America is not in the Bible, it does have a spiritual beginning in America. And that it began with John Wesley, the founder of Methodism. And I have a, a quote here that on December the 26th, oh, I guess I better get my glasses on. Sometimes I just uh, don't know what I'm doing right away. On December the 26th, 1747, he exhorted Methodists to renew their covenant, covenant with God. He writes in his journal, I strongly urge the holy giving up of ourselves to God and renewing in every point our covenant that the Lord should be our God. We read that again. I strongly urge the holy giving up of ourselves to God and renewing in every point our covenant that the Lord should be our God. Amazing, isn't it? Several hundred years ago, the beginning, actually, of... Uh, the uh, celebration of the new year in America. Well, it's been suggested that there are at least uh, seven steps to spiritual renewal in the scripture. I won't get all of them today. I'll have to probably continue next week. But first of all, the first step for renewal is that nothing happens without a desire to be renewed. Again, repeat that, nothing happens without a desire to be renewed. Now, I want to read the words of Jesus. This is in Matthew chapter 5 and uh, verse 6. Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. You see, there's that hunger inside of us. We, we really desire something. And uh, he follows this up with the promise or they shall be filled. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Another promise that we can claim if we have this hunger and thirst after righteousness. Now, the second step is repentance. Now, uh, repentance, let me make this clear, is not changing our ways as is popular, uh, popularly thought and preached in many pulpits and by many Bible scholars. You see, the Greek word repentance, and the Greek word is metanoia, which literally means to change your mind. And um, it's um, understanding what uh, area uh, that needs working on or what area I'm doing is uh, wrong, what thing I'm doing is wrong. Uh, Revelation 3, verses 17 through 19 are a good example of this. And I'll read, and remember, these are Jesus' words to uh, churches, uh, certain churches in the chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation. And um, in uh, Revelation 19, this is a church that says, Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, you do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And I counsel you, and it's Jesus talking to the leaders of the church, I counsel you to buy from me gold reformed, uh, or refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see, and as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. <laughs> he says, repent. The Greek word is metanoia. 
And so, the church says, uh, I've got everything I need. Food, shelter, clothing. And God says, you might have all that, but you have nothing of spiritual value. Uh, John Piper, I agree with him when he says that in America and uh, in the average church, the American church, uh, is driven by commercialism. That is, getting things, but they're things of this world and not things of Christ. And it's like, uh, who needs God? We have everything we want. And of course, the uh, coronavirus and the lack of so many things brings out all of this in us. We, we can hardly wait to stock up on what we don't have because there's going to be a shortage. And we just worry about the things of this world. I know, I've done it. Still part of that as well. Making sure I've got all I need to get by, but uh, what about God? Where does he enter into this? Are we trusting him? And so uh, we've got everything we need. And so who needs God, you see? Now, changing one's bad habits, and this is what I want to emphasize today, does not change one's heart. Revival comes, true repenting, biblically, is a change of heart. And that's what we need in the church today. That's what I need. And I know that's what you need as well. First of all, have a desire to see revival. And then secondly, to have a desire to change what we're doing wrong. And we need to ask God exactly what that is. So I trust that um, you'll take these things to heart and also be with us next week and uh, I'll continue and hopefully conclude in this devotional time. So join me in prayer, I ask. Oh Lord God, almighty ruler of heaven and over earth, we approach your throne of mercy and grace with thankful hearts. We confess that so often we are full of ourselves and empty of your spirit. So lead us, we pray, in the path of righteousness for your name's sake. We are thankful for the leaders of our nation and pray that they would recognize your authority and your law. Help them and help us as we continue working through the COVID-19 virus and the crisis. And please give us patience as we wait for the cure. And I ask for your blessing on everyone who watches this ministry today and upon all who uh, have uh, understood the content and, and those provided the content for the program. All these things we ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. And amen.
In church history, we'll be looking at Charles Wesley, called the greatest hymn writer of all time. He was said to have averaged 10 poetic lines a day for 50 years. He wrote 8,989 hymns, 10 times the volume composed by the only other candidate Isaac Watts, who could conceivably claim to be the world's greatest hymn writer. He composed some of the most memorable and lasting hymns of the church. Hark the herald angels sing, and can it be, oh for a thousand tongues to sing, love divine, all loves excelling. Jesus lover of my soul, Christ the Lord is risen today. Soldiers of Christ arise and rejoice the Lord is King. And yet, he is often referred to as the forgotten Wesley. His brother, John, is considered the organizational genius behind the founding of Methodism. But without the hymns of Charles, the Methodist movement may have gone nowhere. As one historian put it, the early Methodists were taught and led as much through Charles's hymns as through sermons and John's pamphlets. Charles Wesley was the 18th of Samuel and Susanna Wesley's 19 children. Only 10 lived to maturity. He was born prematurely in December 1707 and appeared dead. He lay silent, wrapped in wool for weeks. When older, Charles joined his siblings as each day, his mother Susanna, who knew Greek, Latin, and French, methodically taught them for six hours. Charles then spent 13 years at Westminster School, where the only language allowed in public was Latin. He added nine years at Oxford, where he received his master's degree. It was said that he could reel off the Latin poet Virgil by the half hour. It was off to Oxford University next, and to counteract the spiritual tepidity of the school, Charles formed the Holy Club with two or three others, celebrated communion weekly and observed a strict regimen of spiritual study. Because of the group's religious regimen, which later included early rising, Bible study, and prison ministry, members were called Methodist with a lowercase m. In 1735, Charles joined his brother John they were now both ordained to become a missionary in the colony of Georgia. John as chaplain of the rough outpost and Charles as secretary to Governor Oglethorpe. 
shot at, slandered, suffering sickness, shunned even by Oglethorpe, Charles could have echoed John's sentiments as they dejectedly returned to England the following year. I went to America to convert the Indians, but oh, who will convert me? It turned out to be the Moravians. After returning to England, Charles taught English to Moravian Peter Bowler, who prompted Charles to look at the state of his soul more deeply. During May 1738, Charles began reading Martin Luther's volume on Galatians while ill. He wrote in his diary, I labored, waited, and prayed to feel who loved me and gave himself for me. He shortly found himself convinced and journaled, I now found myself at peace with God and rejoice in hope of loving Christ. Two days later, he began a hymn, began writing a hymn celebrating his conversion. At evangelist George Whitefield's instigation, John and Charles eventually submitted to be more vile and do the unthinkable preach outside of church buildings. In his journal entries from 1739 to 1743, Charles computed the number of those to whom he had preached. Of only those crowds for whom he stated a figure, the total during these five years comes to 149,400. From June 24 through July 8, 1738, Charles reported preaching twice to crowds of 10,000 at Moorfields, once called that Coney Island of the 18th century. He preached to 20,000 at Kensington Common, Kennington Common, plus gave a sermon on justification before the University of Oxford. On a trip to Wales, in 1747, the adventurous evangelist, now 40 years old, met 20-year-old Sally Gwynn, whom he soon married. By all accounts, their marriage was a happy one. Charles continued to travel and preach, sometimes creating tension with John, who complained that I do not even know when and where you intend to go. His last nationwide trip was in 1756. After that, his health led him gradually to withdraw from itinerant ministry. He spent the remainder of his life in Bristol and London, preaching at Methodist chapels. Throughout his adult life, Charles wrote verse, predominantly hymns for use in Methodist meetings. He produced 56 volumes of hymns in 53 years, producing in his lyrics what Brother John called a distinct and full account of scriptural Christianity. The Methodists became known and sometimes mocked for their exuberant singing of Charles's hymns. A contemporary observer recorded, the song of the Methodists is the most beautiful I have ever heard. They sing in a proper way with devotion, serene mind, and charm. Charles Wesley quickly earned admiration for his ability to capture universal Christian experience in memorable verse. In the following century, Henry Ward Beecher declared, 
I would rather have written that hymn of Wesley's, Jesus, lover of my soul, than to have the fame of all the kings that ever sat on the earth. The compiler of the massive Dictionary of Hymnology, John Julian, concluded that perhaps taking quantity and quality into consideration, Charles Wesley was the greatest hymn writer of all ages.
Thank you for watching today, and uh, I trust everything we've said and done has been a blessing for you. I know it has been for us as well. So I'll uh, close with a brief prayer and the benediction from Psalm 119. Lord God, we thank you for another opportunity to uh, exalt Christ and to renew our spirits in worship and in praise. Now receive the blessing, Psalm 119. May God's word be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Amen and amen. We thank you for joining us for Vespers. Each week, you may receive the link by email if you will message me, Emily Weaver, with your address. We appreciate your prayerful attention and your valuable time. We also would appreciate your clicking the red subscribe button if you have not already. Thank you too for clicking the like button, that's the little thumbs up, and commenting as you might be led. Finally, below the screen is a share option which allows you to share the program with your friends and family through such sources as email, Facebook, and text. By pressing the very small arrow under your screen, you will see the timeline and information of contributors for the program. Should you be interrupted, you can look there and pick 
back up where you left off. Scrolling further down will take you to a blog which describes the early days of our Vesper work.